What's up everybody? Today we're going to look at the Kef Q150. I actually purchased this just a couple days ago. It went on sale from, they said the regular price is 600 bucks. I don't know if that's actually what it really is, but it went down to 299 and as of right now, that's where the price is. So I really bumped this speaker to the front of my queue because I know that there's a lot of people that are curious about it. And if it performs well, then it's a no brainer. And I don't know how long it's gonna be on sale. So that's why I'm going ahead and rushing this one out ASAP and bumping everything else to the back for the time being. So with that said, let's go ahead and start talking about this speaker. This is a two-way design. It features a single coaxial concentric drive unit. It comes in ported or sealed configuration. It features a one inch dome tweeter, and it also features a five and a quarter inch mid range. And they operate in tandem together as a coaxial design. My listening was done upstairs in my home theater room, which features acoustic paneling throughout. So this is going to be maybe a little bit different than your room. I say that because when we get into the data, you'll see where there's a little bit of an uptick in the high frequency response, which might cause the speaker to sound a little bit treble heavy to you. To me in my room, it wasn't really that apparent, but when I did bring it downstairs and listen to it in mono, where there is less room treatment or really just none other than the typical furnishings. I did find that it to be a little bit brighter than I would personally care for. I also say that because if you are listening in the near field, maybe say a meter or so or less, then you might also find that to be the case. But in my listening conditions, it was always at about three to four meters. As far as volume goes, you're going to want to use a subwoofer. You'll see why in a little bit as well. But the thing I love about Kef speakers, and they always seem to do this, is they just have a great sense of soundstage depth. And they really do it better than most any other speakers that I've used to date. And I really attribute that to the coaxial design where the tweeter and the mid are coaxially aligned in time. So they basically arrive almost precisely at the same time. I can't tell you that that is 100% the case. That's just my anecdotal information. It could simply be that they are aligned vertically and horizontally. So you get the same soundstage spread vertically as you do horizontally or thereabouts. And we're going to see why I say thereabouts in a second. The design that I tested was in ported configuration. And then I did do a test in sealed configuration that'll come next. But I want you to know right now that the majority of the data that you're about to see is going to be with the speaker in ported configuration. First up is the CEA 2034 Spinorama data. Now, all of this data is captured using my Clipple near field scanner. It is a state of the art sound system analysis machine, fully robotic, crazy awesome. It allows you to get anechoic data in a non anechoic room. And that's useful for us so we can look at how the speaker is likely to perform in various scenarios and make good analysis about where a speaker meets our need or our, our criteria, I should say, and where we may or may not want to add acoustic paneling and just other attributes like that. Now, looking at this data, first cuff, it actually looks pretty good, but you can see that there is a directivity index mismatch at about the one and a half to two kilohertz region. And I'll show you where I think that comes from in a little bit. We see an average sensitivity of about 84 dB. So this speaker is gonna need some power. I use about 230 watts at four meters and it was more than adequate for what I was needing. However, without using a high pass filter, the woofer will basically just overexert itself. So you'll want to use a subwoofer for this speaker if you're planning on listening at louder volumes. The extension is pretty nice and gets down into the kick drum area pretty reasonably. So personally speaking, that's a go, no go situation. If I'm going to use a bookshelf speaker and I'm not going to use a subwoofer, it's got to get down to at least 50 Hertz. If you're going to use a subwoofer, it's not that big of a deal, but it's nice knowing the extension is there if you want it to be there. Now on this line, you can see the resonances that pop up. Now I'm not necessarily sure what's causing the resonances, but the good thing is they can be equalized out pretty reasonably. And I say that because of the linearity through the directivity indices measurements that we see here. And the fact that these trace in all measurements, which means that you can take an equalizer and knock down those peaks a little bit. Are they going to be problematic without equalization? You know, to be honest with you, I didn't find them to be an issue. Usually when I have issues with resonances, it's in the 100 to 300 Hertz region. Those tend to stick out to me more than resonances higher in the mid range. And also the level of 
this higher peak one is low enough to where it may not be completely audible to you. The one that does concern me though without equalization would be this one right here just because it's so broad. And then if we look at the estimated in-room response, we can kind of see what I was talking about earlier when I said that I listened to music in a room with acoustic panels. And that's gonna come into play in this area right here. That top end has a boost on it. Now, some people may like that. I run into some people who like that sound. I run into some people who don't like that sound. Personally speaking, I'm not a fan of that. I, I like a more linear response throughout, and I would prefer for this response to just be falling off a bit more smoothly. But if you go back to the DI index, you can see that you can get away with some equalization up in this area, but around the eight kilohertz area, you're gonna have some issues, which means that I could knock that down a little bit if I wanted to via EQ, although I did not try it. The other aspect is that the radiation of the speaker gets wider at this frequency range, which means that there is more going out into the room, which means that with acoustic paneling, you could knock that down. And the thing I kind of like about that and find kind of interesting is acoustic panels are only effective over a certain frequency range. And most panels are not gonna be effective down below maybe like one kilohertz or so. And I say that based on, you know, a few inch thick material, depending on what you're using. If you use thinner material, then it's gonna be less effective further down in frequency. And I'm kind of thinking that, you know, standard furnishings, drapes, such of that nature, drapes, um, maybe just a couch, a chair, those kind of things might help to reduce some of this down. In my living room, I didn't have that, that effect, mainly because I've got drapes on one wall, but not on the other wall. So I did notice it more in my living room than I did in my home theater room. And as I said, this can be preference. You might like that, but personally speaking, I don't like that. Now on the lower end of things, depending on how you're drawing this line, you could say that there's going to be a trough in the mid-range by about 1 to 2 dB. And that could add some, or I guess I, sh I should say that could take away from some fullness of vocals. The other way you could view this is, you could say that these resonances are really the problem. Because if you just draw the line through here, then you can see that you're more likely to line up if you drop this line a little bit with the rest of the higher frequency. Now you would still have this up here that's problematic but the resonances would stand out more. So I, I say all of that to say, depending on what you are listening for, depending on how well-trained your ear is, depending on what your reference is, you could either hear this dip in the mid-range or you would hear this bump from the resonances. And personally speaking, I noticed the dip in the mid-range more than I felt like there was a resonance bump. This graphic shows us the response as you go from on axis to off axis all the way to the side, 90 degrees out to the speaker. and it actually looks pretty smooth. However, if we notice there's a plateau around five kilohertz or so, so you're kind of falling down smoothly, and then around 5K, you're bumping up a little bit at the more on-axis frequencies, and the further off-axis you go, you're just kind of flattening out. Ideally, these lines would just keep falling down, and the reason that you have that bump in the estimated in-room response, I believe, is due to these flattening out. So the radiation pattern is narrowing up until you get to about five kilohertz or so, and then it gets a little bit wider again. Now remember I mentioned that we're gonna have a little bit of a directivity imbalance. The reason for that I believe is the vertical response. You can see that there's kind of a bunching up of the responses plus or minus 30, 40 degrees right through here. And I believe the vertical response is what's causing that directivity index mismatch, which means that your horizontal response is actually pretty good and clean through that area. Now we're gonna look at the horizontal radiation. This is a bird's eye view of the radiation of the speaker per frequency as you go out into a room. So the speaker would be right in the center here, 200 Hertz out to 20 kilohertz going lengthwise. And we can see that there is indeed, again, this resonance right through here around the 1.2 or so kilohertz region and that causes you to get a little bit wider out through there. For the most part, I would say that the radiation pattern is somewhat narrow, and that's something that I tend to find with KEF speakers in general. Um, personally, I would like to have a wider radiation pattern. That's just a personal preference. And then you can also see, as I mentioned previously, there's a bump in the radiation above about five kilohertz. So you can actually see where you get wider throughout the radiation pattern above five kilohertz. This is the distortion profile at 86 dB at one meter. 
and now at 96 dB at one meter. And now we're looking at the compression linearity graphic of the response as you go from 76 dB to 86, 96, and 102 dB. Basically what this graphic is telling me that at extreme volumes, the 102 dB in purple, you're going all over the place in linearity, the lower you go in frequency. Ideally, it wouldn't be as varied as this. I did test a Rendall speaker recently, smaller bookshelf speaker, but I'm over twice the price. And it had better linearity throughout until it got to 80 hertz, and that's when the linearity and compression really started to ramp up. With this speaker, what this data and the distortion data are telling me in combination is simply use a subwoofer. It's really as simple as that. I would recommend crossing over at least maybe 80 hertz for sure, I would even recommend going up to 100 hertz or maybe even 120 hertz. Use a subwoofer, cross it over higher, and I think you're gonna have better results. Now we're gonna talk about the sealed performance. And the resonances still exist, so that hasn't changed, which indicates most likely those resonances are due from panel vibration. I don't know if it's side wall or rear wall, top, bottom wall, I'm not sure. I actually considered taking the speaker apart, but then I thought, you know what? I'm not gonna get into that today. Maybe another time if I don't give these away sooner than that. But for now, I just wanted to show you that, yes, it's not the port that's causing the resonance. It's actually the enclosure. The base roll-off is typical sealed configuration, 12 dB per octave, and it starts off a little bit higher in frequency than it does in the port configuration. Just use a subwoofer. You're not going to get really low base in sealed configuration. This is kind of common sense stuff, though. You may be wondering, does the distortion change when you go sealed? Well, no, not really. I'll show you. 3% line here 86 db and then at 96 db and if you go back and compare this 96 db versus the other 96 db the profile is basically the exact same until you get to the tuning frequency of the porta configuration distortion drops down and then it ramps back up even quicker so it really doesn't matter in terms of distortion which configuration you go with because you're going to be crossing the speaker over at a frequency higher than where the distortion really starts to kick in. And that's it for this review. I hope you appreciate it and I really do hope you learned something. My recommendation is for sure at the sale price of 300 bucks, pick them up. Um, I compare these to the Emotiva B1 Plus, which I think was probably my, my favorite budget speaker, at least in this kind of price range for a while. Personally speaking, I like the KEF more, and I like it more because of the soundstage depth. I mean, the KEFs, in terms of soundstage, just do something for me that most other speakers cannot do. The only issue that I really have with this KEF is that the bass is just not going to be adequate for higher volume listening. You're going to want to use the subwoofer, no doubt. And then the high frequency bump, that was problematic for me, so I would recommend that you either... Plan accordingly. You can actually just tow them in or tow them out a little bit, see what you think. You can add some room treatment if you want to try that, or you can just take one band of EQ and knock that down. But those were the issues for me with this particular speaker. But having said that, I don't think they're big enough to make you not want to buy the speaker at its current sale price. Now, if it goes back up to the 600 bucks per pair, then I don't know. We're, we, it may be a different ballgame at that point. I just can't think of anything right now around those price points that I would find better. But honestly, I don't even know that I've tested many in that price region. So it would it would require me to go back and actually flip through a lot of data to make that determination. But at 300 bucks per pair, or maybe even at 400 bucks per pair, I've got no problem recommending them if you want to try them out. And finally, if you want to support this channel, if you like what you see, please remember to hit the subscribe and hit the notification bell. Hit the thumbs up button and do all that kind of cool stuff. If you want to support monetarily, I do have a Patreon and that helps me to afford to buy things like these because as I said earlier, I bought these with my own money. Nobody sent them to me. Nobody loaned them to me. They were brand new in box. I broke them in. I tested them. I listened to them. They're my speakers and I'll probably give them away to a patron or something like that at some point in time if I decide not to play around with them a little bit more and play around with the, the lining inside. I do use affiliate links. I'll probably throw one down below in the description. If you want to buy it, that would be great. That helps me out with a small percentage. If you don't, that's fine. It's, it's not the end of the world. You can just Google it and buy it however else you want, but know that it is appreciated and I'm not shilling. You've got the data that holds me accountable and allows you to see what you want to see from it. But again, if you want to support and you want to buy the speaker, you can do that through using one of my affiliate links, which I'll post below. And that's it for this review. Again, hope you learned something. Hope you appreciate it. We'll talk to y'all later. Peace.